me and immediately froze up. So we came back here and set up in my sunroom. Doesn't quite look quite as much like Christmas, but we'll get a bit of that feeling of Advent from the um, PowerPoint. So we'll, we'll, we have photos from inside the sanctuary there. Um, uh, for announcements, I want to point out, we're just starting a um, special card ministry to prisoners. This is through the Board of Church and Society of the New York Annual Conference. And so we have printed out cards and given some potential greetings and some basic instructions. And the basic instructions include the fact that when we're sending cards to prisoners, we don't want to put our last names, nor do we want to put our addresses on them. So if you would like to participate in this, we have the cards here out on the front porch. You're welcome to pick up one or uh, several if you'd like. Fill them out and then bring them back here and Alex Edwards Boudre will put them into a manila envelope and ship them off to the conference. We're hoping to do this in the coming week. So we want to mail them by Friday. Uh, so everybody is welcome to do that. Um, if you want to do it and you're not close by and you can't yep. pick up, contact us. We'll send you the link so that you can download the photos yourself. They get sent to Matt Kranz. We have passed the deadline. The deadline was December 6th, but I talked to Reverend Kranz and he said, absolutely, we want to have the cards so people can still do this even though we're past the official deadline on the website. So contact us if you need more information. Um, going to invite everybody, and I think most everybody is muted, but we invite everybody to mute. There will be a point in the service where I ask you to unmute, but anyone who's had experience with the internet and with Zoom knows that if we're all unmuted and try and talk, it becomes a jumbled mess. So most of the service, you are muted. Um, we invite you to do that, and then we follow up by muting you from our uh, home base, so to speak. However, we cannot unmute you. So when I invite you to be unmuted to share prayers, you'll need to do that yourself. And if you are dialing in the way that you unmute is star six, if I am correct, um, that will get you unmuted. So all of that going to lead us into our prelude. And so I invite you into worship this morning as we come together to worship our Lord. And we will start with a prelude. Our organist is Helen Kegeris, and she, um, she brings us the music today. So let us settle into worship. Thank you. 
And so as we settle into our worship, we will be invited in in a pre-recorded piece where there are responses. There is one point where I will speak in the recording and we echo what is said. So I invite you right now to take a deep breath. And let us welcome the spirit. Invoke the Gospel of Matthew and Isaiah. A messenger appears as a sign from God, heralding a new era. In each passage, the words, do not be afraid, appear, offering a clue that the messenger, whether prophet or angel, was referencing something that induced fear in the recipient. A new way of being together, of relating and loving, takes courage eschewing the present order of things so that a new and better day can be born. I invite you now, if you have candles in front of you, I have the oil lamp that the United Methodist Churches in this conference were sent by the bishop to remind us how we are connected to each other. So that is lit. We light one Advent candle, the candle of hope, and then a little lopsided but Love sometimes is a little lopsided. We give more love than we receive, and yet we give love, the candle of love. Amen. 
Having lit your candles, I invite you to turn to others in your household or on the screen. We're doing a virtual passing of the peace. You may bow to each other. You may make a peace sign um, to each other. If you're living in the same household, you can actually touch, we'll allow that. Um, if you're on the phone, know that people are indeed holding you in peaceful blessings at this moment as we greet each other. And again, we are so happy to have enlarged our group by um, joining with West Hills this morning. And so for our children's time for Advent, we have been doing, um, we have started with this little light of mine. We are doing one verse each week and we are doing it in sign, in ASL. Um, so this week we have Ocean Conti is doing it for us. And the, the, it's, forgive me because the video came out a little fuzzy on my computer, but we'll see it anyway. Amen. So we're letting our light shine. This, um, now we're going to get to see ocean, uh, not quite as fuzzy. Ocean and her grandmother and grandfather are with us this morning to share the lessons. We hear first from Isaiah. And Isaiah 7, where we are hearing about um, signs to the people. Again, Isaiah was written as the people were in exile in Babylon. So I invite you to hear the word. In the days of Uzzah, Jothan's son and grandson of Judah's king Uzziah, Aram's king Nazim and Israel's king Pika, Ramalia's son, came up to attack Jerusalem, but they couldn't overpower it. When the house of David was told that Aram had become allies with Ephraim, their hearts and the hearts of their people shook as the trees of a forest shake when there is a wind. But the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Azah, you and your son Shir Jashub, at the end of the channel of the upper pool by the road to the field where laundry is washed, and say to him, Be careful and stay calm. Don't fear and don't lose heart over these two pieces of smoking torches, over the burning anger of Razim Aram and Malala's son. Aram had planned evil against you and Ephraim and Ramallah's son, saying, let's march up against Judiah, tear it apart, capture it for ourselves, and install Tabeel's son as its king. <laughs> but the Lord God says it won't happen, it won't take place. The chief of Aram is Damascus. The chief of Damascus is Razim. In 65 more years, Ephraim will be shattered as a nation. The chief of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief of Samaria is the son of Amalia. If you don't believe this, you can't be trusted. Again, the Lord spoke to Uzzah. Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave, or as high as heaven. But Uzzah said, I won't ask, I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant, is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. As we said last week, our worship series this Advent calls on the power of music that has always called humanity to a brighter tomorrow. Rather than turn away from music and sorrow, 
we will turn toward the story of music and deepen our appreciation of its role in healing, change, and reconciliation. So indeed, on this Sunday, with love at the center, we can attest that probably love songs top the charts in the history of human soul. And now we hear from the Gospel of Matthew, and we first hear Jesus's genealogy. Where is uh, Ocean or Joanne or Ken reading? Okay, we hope. Matthew, Abraham, Gospel Lesson for Matthew, page four. Well, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. <laughs> Ju uh, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Ezran, and Ezran was the father of Aram. Aram was the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose, father, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Uh, Rehoboam is the father of Abjah. Abjah was the father of Asaph. Asaph was the father of Jehovah-shat. Jehovah-shat was the father of Jeram. Jeram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Hazah. Uh, Hazah was the father of, Haki, of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of, Man, of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amos. Amos was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers. This was at the time of the exile to Babylon. Okay. After the exile to uh, Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of uh, Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud. Abiad was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliad. Eliad was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Methan. Methan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. He was called the Christ. So there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 generations from the exile to Babylon to the Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man because he didn't want to humiliate her. He decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he was saved. He will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through, the prophet would be fulfilled. 
look, a virgin will come, will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God's, God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relationships with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. Amen. So this Sunday, our readings talk of signs, signs of God's love, God's presence, and also of God's challenge to us to get love right. Now, the idea of signs may not sit well on everybody's ears. Some folks today believe in signs and some say, yeah, that's just that Old Testament stuff. That, that has no place in our life. But if we look at the signs, first of all, they were important to the ancient people. But if we look at them as symbols, then it might read more, um, it may have a fuller meaning to us if we think of them as symbols, intangible things that, um, or tangible things pointing to something beyond themselves. Our children's time, Ocean signed the song. So even if you don't have ears to hear, you have eyes to see. And in fact, last night, uh, Glenn and I watched Beyond the Sea, the biopic on, pseudo biopic on Bobby Darren. And he talks about, um, at one point, as he's trying to transition his music, people hear what they see. And so that signs help us to see. The sign in the Isaiah passage is a child. Children were often signs in the Hebrews texts. And we can see the child as future generations. This is the future and the future is Emmanuel, God with us. Now last week we started with the opening chapter of Mark. Mark is sort of fast and furious. Mark skips everything, gets right to the point. Um, sort of an action packed, and it sounds like it was uh, maybe meant for the Instagram crowd. It's short and sweet and to the point, gives us a point and moves on quickly. This week, Matthew, Matthew is talking to people that are steeped in their Bible, and so Matthew um, is helping people to place this story within their history. That whole long genealogy is a placing of Jesus within the history of the chosen people of God. This is not someone just coming out of the blue. This is somebody who has history in our life, in our culture. He has roots and therefore this is a sign. Um, Matthew connects him not only with the people, but we hear even in Matthew's genealogy a bit of that history as he talks about the exile to Babylon. He talks, he includes that in there to remind people um, that this is in the midst of our history. Here we see the struggles connected to the present and connected to the future. So Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant and he's ready to walk away. But Joseph gets a sign, an angel that speaks to him and says, we're working toward the future here. Don't put Mary aside. Don't walk out of this picture because you are part of that story. Love her, love the child, love what might be and will be. The only way for us in the midst of darkness as well as in the midst of light, the only way for us to move forward 
is to love the future, to embrace the future, to look for the signs that things are changing, to look for the signs of how God is working, even here, even now, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all that we are experiencing. And I, I look and say, a year ago, how many grandparents had not yet moved to Zoom or FaceTime or anything like that and said, I'm sorry, we're just not going to see you this year because we can't travel anymore and we can't figure out how to do that computer stuff. And how many people now know how to do that and can anticipate seeing family that a year ago they couldn't. And I look at how God is moving even in the midst of Pastor Melanie's um, surgery to bring us together, to unite us from one community to another, that we might rekindle old friendships and see new faces, to look and say, oh, wow, look at all of these people that like me are United Methodists, that like me are Christ followers. Sometimes in this world, it feels like there are so few Christ followers. And yet this is a sign that there's more of us than we think. Not the people that like to go on TV and get their names in the paper declaring I'm a Christian and therefore you must do it my way. But people that are seeking to be in community, people that are seeking to hold each other in prayer and in hope and in love. We are the future of the church, even as we are the present of the church. And God is coming among us if we have eyes to see. Amen. I invite you, we are going to join in the litany of belief. Um, I will start us a bit and then we have a responsive reading and we're not on, on asking you to unmute for this part yet. Um, so again, you're, you'll, be, you'll be talking but not hearing anybody other than Glenn and me. So in times when humanity disappoints, perhaps even when our own thoughts and behaviors disappoint, it is an important act to call out, name, and claim the consequences of our wrongs. And in times of distress, it is a prophetic act to call out, name, and claim our belief that daring to love each other as God loves us is a faithful response. Hear these statements of belief. I believe that we have been taught to fear one another. And I believe that we are capable of learning to love. And I, I'm actually going to put that up so you'll see words in front of you. We're hoping, and then I'm going to start that again. Here we go. Kathy is going to get us to the start of that litany. I believe that we have been taught to fear one another. And... I believe, I believe that, that we are, are capable of learning, learning to love. love. I believe that our society is built on a foundation of oppression of some over others. And I believe, believe that, that we can, can speak this truth and move to act in ways that balance this inequity. I believe that we are afraid. And I believe that we can learn on each other and God for courage, courage to, to face, face anything. anything. I believe even when we are discouraged, we, we believe, believe that even when we are discouraged, discouraged raising our voices, voices for justice will bring, bring about, about more love in, in the world. world. Amen. Now I invite you to unmute as we come into a time where you will be invited to share your um, prayers for each other. So 
I invite you to get into a comfortable position. Quiet yourself down. Be as still and quiet as you can. Take a deep breath. A deep listening posture, perhaps with your eyes closed or fixed on a candle, as we prepare for a time of prayer, I will pray aloud and leave space within the prayer for raising up first those people and places that are of concern to us and in our hearts this day, and then a second Time, I will raise up and invite you into praying for those things that have given you joy and love this past week. Let us pray, gracious and loving God. We come before you in love this day. We come knowing how much you love us and how much you love all your children. And so we lift before you we call out the names of people and places that need your love this day. I invite you to just call out. Reverend Jane Jensen. Penfield. Please, Harry Brown. Kelvin. Eric. Aaron Zerpoli. Roland Gates fan. Shereen. Brad Ford. Andrew Gordon. Schreiber. My family. Jeanette. Jennifer Pasco. Pastor Anna. Melanie and her mom. Joanne Knight's family. Marge Klein. Linda. Pastor Rosalind and her family. The family of Brian Denise. For the people of Middle Collegiate Church, which burned down yesterday. Oh, oh no. Oh, gosh. For all those hit by the storm, the Northeaster that passed through New England, for all those who are suffering from power outage. For all of our children and their schoolmates and the school systems all over the world. The homeless and the hungry. Yes, Lord. For the homeless. Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And gracious God, we give thanks for all those places where we have seen love right in our own lives, in our own neighborhoods. We give you thanks for those places, those people that have touched us. Pray for life of man. Never stops looking at me. My Our church. Philip. Our church. For nurses and doctors and other first responders. And all the essential service people. The grocery people. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray as Jesus taught us, the prayer of our hearts, and I invite you to pray it in your own language, in your own style. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Honor is the kingdom, power, power, glory, glory forever. Amen. 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 And my offering plate is still over in the church. I did not think to bring it back. But that's okay, because what we bring to offer, some have already sent in their offerings to their church, some may have it in front of them. All of us have what we offer God within our hearts. And so I invite you to hold that right now before you. Hold your hands together before you, letting that be a sign of all that you are giving to God this day. Let us give thanks and give, pray over this offering. Loving and almighty God, we come before you with our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. We pray that you will receive them, that you will bless them, that you will use them to spread your love in our communities, in our nation, in our world. We pray for your coming among us, for being among us, now and always. In Christ's name, amen. 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 If you haven't Remuted again, we invite you to mute because the carol singing is always awful on Zoom. Um, so you get to sing at home as loudly and lustily as you want because we won't hear you and it's okay. Um, our carol, we are experiencing carols of resistance for this advent. And so this one, it came upon a midnight clear, was written in 1849 by a Massachusetts Unitarian minister, the Reverend Edmund Hamilton Sears. So one verse has been left out of the hymnals over the decades since he wrote it. Uh, a new hymnal, Glory to God, restored this powerful verse that refers to the love song of the angels being drowned out by our warring nature. And this verse says, yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel strain have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And we at war on earth hear not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise and cease the strife and hear the angels sing. So we've restored that verse to our singing. It will be our third verse this day. Let us be reminded that we are to listen to the angel chorus and then join it, raising our voices with the message that love, not hate, is the answer. So I invite you to join in the singing of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Thank you. 
And so I invite you, as we move into our benediction, I invite you to, if you can, safely pick up this week's candle and hold it high for the benediction. If not, put your hand near the candle, recognizing the light of Christ within the candle. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so my friends, like bells ringing out the news that God is with us, Emmanuel, and continue to fill the night left by sadness with messages of love. Go into your lives humming the tunes that keep that hope alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat after me. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Amen. 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 We will have our postlude, and then you're invited to stay on to say a few words of farewell to each other for the week. So let us hear our postlude again. We have Helen. <laughs> stop the share so that we have a little more room for us on the screen and everyone is invited to unmute and to say bye to each other. We're glad you were here with us this day. Yes. Look at all. Thank you for having us. Yes. Welcome, Welcome to the service. Have a good day, everybody.